when Aaron Nimzovich was asked which of his games was, in his opinion, his best chess game, he did not cite his incredibly famous Immortal Zugzwing game against Samish. Instead, he said, the one I played in the Dresden tournament in 1926 against Rubinstein, who is, as you know, an extremely dangerous antagonist. I do not know any other of my important games, which so well illustrates the principle of effective hindrance of the adversary's forces, while at the same time securing the mobility of one's own forces. I'm with Nemzovich. This is my favorite game of his many brilliant games that he won, and it's my number five best chess game of the 1920s. Ever the creative theoretician, Nemzovich begins the game with c4, c5, knight f3, knight to f6, knight c3, pawn d5, pawn takes, knight takes, and now pawn to e4. About this move, he says, an innovation of mine that, in exchange for the backwardness of the d2 pawn, aims at securing other advantages. Now, to be honest, if I didn't have any prior knowledge, I would reject this move thinking that, well, the weakness of the d2 pawn and also the d3 and d4 squares would be a significant issue. I'm one of the people who overvalues insignificant positional factors in a game at the expense of tactical factors. But here, Nimzovich is completely right, and he's backed up by a ton of modern theory looking at this particular line. It's very interesting, often very unclear, and there are many high-level games in exactly this position. After pawn e4, the knight jumps into b4, and now we see bishop c4. Nimzovich comments that the immediate exploitation of the weakness at d3 is not possible at this point, and he gives the example knight d3 check, which is a theoretical line today, and this leads to a bong cloud. The king steps up to e2 on move 7 in the middle of the game here with the queens still on the board. Now, black can try to inconvenience the king, but with a lead in development for white, there's no real problem. For example, knight f4 check and then king f1 is very unclear. White has an idea of pawn d4 here, which looks pretty effective as the knight is kind of hanging out here. Again, lots of theory here, and I'm not diving into all the theory. And Nimzovich also cites the line, knight takes c1, rook takes c1, knight c6, bishop b5, bishop d7, bishop takes, bishop takes, and then says that white is better because pawn d4. And of course he's right. The fact that the king, on, uh, the king is sitting on e2 here is no trouble at all for white. And what really matters is that white is so much better mobilized and has a presence in the center, leading to a nice positional plus for white. So... Backing up though, this doesn't happen. Instead, after bishop c4, we are denied the bong cloud after knight d3 check, king up to e2, and instead we get pawn to e6, which looks pretty solid. White castles now, and now we get knight out to c6. The knight is eyeing the d4 square, which seems appealing, but now simply pawn d3, and there's now an idea of a3 because the knight can no longer go into d3, so knight d4. This allows the other knight to pull back to c6 if needed. Knight takes d4, pawn takes d4, and knight e2. At this point, Nemzovich gives his assessment of these developments, saying, White now stands very well. Any weakness that may be said to exist at d3 has been covered up, and the collective mobility of White's kingside, f2, f4 being in mind, is considerable. And what is most important, the apparently blocked-off bishop at c4 plays a crucial preventive role, directed against pawn e6 to e5. In this position, Black's pl black plays pawn to a6, which stops a bishop b5 check, which if you block here with bishop b7, would lose a pawn to knight takes d4. Knight g3, bishop d6, and now pawn to f4, which is a nice move pressing forward with strong pawn play on the king side. However, Nimzovich points out a possible improvement. In fact, the modern engine still likes pawn to f4 and thinks it may be the best move, but the tactical queen g4 was also very dangerous, and it was Nimzovich's preference after the game. The immediate attack here on g7 is pretty concerning. You castle now, and then there's Bishop g5. White has a lot of attacking power in this sector of the board, and it's very easy to lose the game in just a couple of moves. For example, the natural bishop to e7 here uh, runs into bishop h6, threatening mate, 
and then after bishop f6, there's still bishop takes g7, a nice tactic. The point of bishop takes g7 is that after bishop takes, there's knight h5. The mate threat cannot be defended by queen f6 because that square is also covered by the knight on h5. The computer does point out a defense though. That is the move pawn to f6. And it's easy to reject this move because it does drop this pawn here on e6, right? But after bishop takes e6, king h8, there are, th there are threats here and threats here. And that means that black is actually doing okay. A very, very computer-like defense in this position. So all of that didn't happen as interesting as the queen g4 lines were and as much as Nimzovich might have wished that he went for these lines after the game and instead he, st he played the still very strong pawn to f4. Castles now for black, queen f3, king over to h8, bishop to d2, tickling the knight over here, and pawn to f5, preventing any f5 for white, which is probably the best idea in this position. Black must expand and try to blockade. But now Nimzovich develops his rook, rook a to e1, and all of his pieces are nicely positioned in this position. Additionally, the rook that just came off of the a1 square over to e1 is eyeing a potential open file here on the, uh, the e file, and that's certainly going to be a big, big factor in the game. So uh, at this point, Rubenstein plays knight c6, and Nimzovich comments. Rubenstein has defended himself with great skill, but White still has one trump in his hand, the E file. Rook E2 getting ready to potentially double, and Queen C7, a move criticized by Nimzovich, who gives an insightful comment. Not good. In cramped positions, one should not give away even the slightest possibility of a future move. Queen C7 gives away the possibility of Queen F6 after a trade on F5. Correct, therefore, was bishop to d7 instead. Nimzovich is entirely correct, and the computer agrees that bishop d7 was an improvement. It's always interesting to read Nimzovich's commentary on his games because I think that no one's mind works quite like Nimzovich's, so he's opening up a strategic uh, level to the game that most of us don't quite possess. After queen c7, we see pawn takes f5, Pawn takes f5, and the next move is one of the great positional moves in chess history. If you don't remember what happened in the thumbnail, then pause the video right here and try to figure out what Nimzovich played. Well, Nimzovich played the brilliant knight to h1. Just an utterly inspiring move. All of his pieces look to be doing pretty well. It'd be easy to double on the e-file, which is very sensible, but the knight on g3 wasn't really contributing. By pulling the knight back to h1 in this position, Nimzovich addresses one of the critical factors in the game, the knight's ineffectiveness on g3 and its potential effectiveness on g5, when it will work tremendously with the bishop on c4 to attack the light squares in black's position. Now, the chess engine may or may not agree with knight h1. I've seen some chess engines rank it as the best move, and I've seen some that have ranked it you know, several moves down in terms of the priority order. But I think that's kind of irrelevant. It's really brilliant, and in the long term in this game, it works incredibly well, and it puts a lot of practical pressure on Rubenstein. Additionally, this is a position where there are a lot of moves of pretty similar value, so the difference between your first move and your fifth move may not be that much in terms of a computer evaluation, but what does matter is that you play with purpose and with a plan, and this maneuver with the knight is exactly the kind of thing that leads to white improving his position over the next several moves and black not achieving the same improvements in his own position. So, knight h1, brilliant move. The game continues with bishop d7, knight f2, the knight continues its journey, rook to e8, challenging the open file, and simply rook e1, uh, you know, bringing the other rook to support the open, the presence on the open file. Rook takes e2, rook takes e2. A big question here is, could you get away with rook e8? And Nimzovich said no, because queen d5 and the rook cannot take because of mate down here. The engine says this is okay because the rook just pulls back with rook f8 but a human would be reluctant to go for 
uh, position where you bring the rook to the open file and then you immediately go and defend and your opponent has a queen in the center of the board here. It doesn't seem like this should work, but the computer indicates that this was a valid defense for black. Instead, though, we see Rubenstein play knight back to d8. The knight continues its journey onward with knight h3. Now, maybe at this point, best was pawn to h6. You don't want to let the knight into g5, and you'd like to also have some more room for your king to move up to h7. Rubenstein never plays h6. It was often a good move, and I do think he suffered strategically from his reluctance to adopt this defensive formation, which would have been much more resilient than the formation he eventually adopts with pawn to g6, weakening the dark squares. Instead, Rubenstein plays his bishop to c6, which allows the queen to come in, queen h5. Now pawn g6, weakening the dark squares a lot, although it doesn't seem like it should be a problem right now, it is going to be a problem later in the game. Queen h4, king to g7, queen f2, tickling the pawn here on d4, bishop c5, and b4. At this point, we see a very, very natural move that seems to be a mistake. Bishop back to b6, or is definitely a mistake. Of course, bishop b6 is holding on to the d4 pawn, and that seems like the only thing you can do. Uh, you're certainly not um, going to just give up the pawn for nothing, right? Well, the answer is yes. You could have played, instead of bishop to b6, bishop back to e7. And the bishop will sit very prettily here, and even if you drop the pawn on d4, the bishops here have a lot of scope. And in fact, black has pretty good compensation for the pawn, according to the computer. It would have been very, very difficult for Nimzovich to win this position, and he certainly wouldn't have been able to play with the singular control of the position that he achieved in the game, where Rubenstein really wasn't able to do much of anything. But the bishop did pull back to b6, and now... In this position, this is the one move that Nimzovich plays in this whole game that's been kind of criticized. And that's just because we can turn on a computer engine and see that there's a winning move here. But Nimzovich's choice is also good. And for a human, maybe it's not so obvious that decisive is simply queen to e1, intending rook to e7. The idea of rook to e7 is just absolutely crushing in this position. There's no way to stop the rook from coming up to the e7 square, and there's no way to hold on after the rook gets to e7 with ideas of, for example, knight g5 afterwards. One line that I really like is king f6, after which there are many wins, but my favorite is rook e7 coming in anyway, very, very beautiful. And if the rook is captured by the queen, then you have queen h4 check. The king will need to move, and you just pick up the queen anyway. A beautiful geometry. Keep in mind that the bishop prevents the king from moving to one of the light squares that would defend the queen. So, queen e1 was totally decisive. And if you're looking at this with a computer, you'll see that right away. But Nimzovich played queen h4, which has a very similar idea. Rook to e7. It also has an idea of knight g5 and an idea of pawn g4. Three very, very effective ideas. To be honest, these ideas are so effective that they almost win as well, but maybe with tenacious defense, black can hold on, though it's not clear. White still is pressing against all possible defenses from black. So after queen h4, we see um, the rook go to e8. One defense that Nimzovich points out that's really interesting is instead of rook e8, rook f6, when knight g5 threatens this, and if h6, a pretty winning move is knight h7. Because if you capture the knight, white captures the rook, and where is the rook going to go that doesn't allow rook into e7 on the next turn? White simply wins, and it's a very, very pretty move. So many pretty moves in this game. So many pretty moves. In the game, though, as I already said, rook e8 was played. The rook comes up to e5, and black doesn't want to take here and open up the dark squares and make a strong pawn on e5. So we see knight f7, and uh, that knight is immediately lopped off. Bishop takes f7, and now queen takes f7, knight g5 attacking the queen and attacking h7, which forces the sad retreating move, queen g8. Rook takes on e8, bishop takes on e8, and queen e1, after which Nimzovich comments, 
A curious position for black. Despite the paucity of material, there is in the air a thread of mate that cannot be warded off. Some fine play now ensues. Nimzovich is getting into the dark squares as we've already kind of indicated is likely to be how this game concludes. Bishop c6 is played. There is no defense, by the way. There are a lot of defensive tries, but there is no actual defense. Queen to e7, check. And now the king pulls back to h8. In this position, I encourage you to pause your video and try to find a win. Well, if you're looking with a chess engine, it's very easy to find the win, of course, but on a human level, it's not necessarily obvious how to finish things off. One move that the computer points out and says is winning is knight f7 check, but knight f7 check actually doesn't do much of anything because after king g7, you just have to go back, moving the knight to e5 or g5 or d8, and then setting up basically the same wins you have in other lines. It doesn't really force the win, it just keeps the winning position. Instead, a more direct win is knight e6, and I do love the win knight e6, simply intending queen into f6 and you're forcing mate. But after knight e6, there is pawn to h5, and it seems like, okay, maybe the king can hide here. How are you finishing things off? The king has a little room to run, but after queen f6, king h7, there is a brilliant move here, g4. This is spectacular, and it's very much, I think, another computer move here. After pawn to g4, if this pawn takes, they're simply made over here, which is very pretty. And if this pawn takes, then there's pawn up here, f5. If captures, you're looking at mate over here. White has gained the use of the bishop on this line right here, adding strength to knight g5 check to captures on g6, et cetera, et cetera. The computer at this point points out that it's made in six. Totally over, beautiful idea, pawn g4. However, that is not what Nimzovich did, but he found something equally beautiful with a similar idea. Not a break over here, but a break on the other wing with pawn b5. Beautifully thematic. Attacking the bishop, sacrificing a pawn to gain this idea. And this is a crushing idea. Pawn to b5 wins brilliantly as well. Again, so many brilliant ideas here, both attacking ones and positional ones. After b4, there is absolutely no defense for black. If the bishop captures here on b5 or the pawn, then there's knight e6, gaining this idea, and after h5, we no longer have to rely on the g4 idea. We can just play bishop b4, and boom, crushing. In fact, Rubinstein realized his position was so hopeless that he played a desperate move in response to pawn b5, queen g7, just giving up a bishop on c6. This is basically resignation, and my only question is, what was the time situation like, and was Rubinstein in a position where he was hoping maybe to flag Nimzovich before he made his 40th move? But Nimzovich makes his 40th move, and he simply consolidates the position. He's got the extra piece. He puts his pieces on brilliant squares. He honestly doesn't do much of anything um, until Rubenstein resigns. He doesn't need to. He's in total control in the position. And after bishop e5 in this position, Rubenstein said, all right, that's enough. You're definitely going to win this one. So I hope that you enjoyed this absolute masterpiece, Nimzovich's favorite game of his own many, many brilliancies. If you want to see more of my favorite games of the 1920s, simply click on that playlist that is popping up on your screen.